you, Chris. Hi, good. How are you? Great. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Amy scheduled me for 30 minute sessions. Um, just because on the last one, I was she was expecting much more time. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. First of all, your hair is fantastic. I used to be a hairstylist. So oh, thank you. Good hair. <laughs> <laughs> So I kind of wanted to try and focus more on stuff that you probably hadn't really talked about. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Cool. I'm excited. <laughs> well, because most, most of the series that I knew you for was stuff that I grew up with, like, back then. Back in the day? Yeah. Oh, that makes me happy because those are the shows, like, the simul dubs are, it's so quick. I feel yeah. like I don't get to be as connected to those characters as I was back in the day when it would take, like, a year to record the series. <laughs> So yes, that's great because I would probably have much more to say about those characters. So I know your first was your first any kind of dubbing experience with uh, Nadesco. Yes, way back in the day. So I auditioned. They were working on uh, Bubblegum Crisis 2040 at ADV Films when I auditioned because that's I remember auditioning to that. It was a scene where one of the characters is in a motorcycle helmet, so we didn't have to worry about flaps. It was great, um, and. When I was there, it took a while. And then finally they called me in for Nadeshko and it was kind of like a trial by fire with Matt Greenfield. Like he was like, okay, these guys are the Jovians. You don't like them, tell them to go home. Like, you know, and so I would do it. And then he's like, okay, now do it as a little boy. Okay, now be a British grandma. Okay, now be a dog or, you know, just throwing things to see if I can do it. Um, and yeah, that was my first experience with anime and then right after that I ended up working on uh, Gasaraki and Generator Call and the rest is history. <laughs> well I thought maybe before that it would have been uh, those who want elves. So what's weird is like I know online people <laughs> some people think I've been acting since the 80s yeah. um, because of the times but usually there's they'll list it by the original release date. Right. So yeah, those who on elves for me didn't come around until later, even though I know it was around a lot earlier than I was around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, would one of your like actual named boy voice characters be uh, the game master in Yu Yu Hakusho? Yes, I don't get to play a lot of little boys because my voice is so high-pitched and nasally and it just kind of is inherently feminine I guess I don't know um so getting to play on Anuma and the game master was super cool because I'm like wow at ADV I never get to be the boy and so here I was at Funimation one of my first things that I did and um they cast me without even really knowing who I was and trusting me with this really great little character and Man, I, I had so much fun. I was like, man, is this what I've been missing out on all these years, not playing the little boys? Like, this is super cool. Yeah. So I really enjoyed him a lot. Well, and I have found that talking to voice actresses that also do boy voices, they kind of have like a process for it specifically. Is there something that you do? No, for me, it was more about, um, because there's only so much I can do with my voice to make it sound more boy-ish, um, it was more about the process as an actor, of, as an actor of becoming a, a little boy and trying to think like a little boy. And I'm very lucky in that I grew up with two younger brothers. Okay. So I was kind of able to tap into, like, especially my youngest brother with Game Master. Like, my little brother Miguel was big into video games. Like, when he was three years old, we were taking him to Nintendo conventions and he was kicking all the older guys' butts playing Mario. So, Miguel was a huge influence for Amanuma, especially. Um, but yeah, I think it's just, I'm one of those people, I'm kind of a bit of an empath. Like my whole deal with being an actor is putting myself in somebody else's shoes and trying to experience what they experience, um, which is great for acting, but horrible at times like this when the world is on fire. Because <laughs> you end up with this bleeding heart, like, oh my gosh, these people are suffering. Great for acting, not really as practical for real life though. <laughs> Well, if you could pick a single one, what do you think is the case where you've had to get the um, darkest emotional headspace for, for a character? Darkest emotional headspace would probably be Tanya and the saga of Tanya the Evil, which is a more recent show. But um, I have a different perspective, maybe. I don't know how other people go about it. But for me, whenever I play a villain character, um, I think it's a much more interesting choice that they they think they're in the right, right? Nobody tries to be evil just to be evil. Usually people think they're correct 
And that is why they keep doing what they're doing. They don't realize they're being villainous, right? So for Tanya, knowing what I know about history and it being a historical fiction and the side that she's on and having to put myself in that headspace, that was so that was, that was dark. <laughs> um, but at the same time, there's an element of fun to it because you know, uh, whether it's my voice or whatnot, I end up playing a lot of like sweet, innocent, yay, look at me, I'm cute. So whenever I get to do like the really dark or the the really uh, questionable villainous characters, it's a lot of fun because it's, it's not my norm. It's not what I normally do. Mm-hmm. Well, I know sort of early on too, there was a lot of um, like emotional confliction with uh, Maria and Witchblade. Yes, she was huge because that character could so easily be so incredibly annoying, right? She was annoying. That was kind of the point that she's this bratty child, right? But that is such a fine line to walk because you want them to be annoying enough that the viewer is like, oh my gosh, this is a child that is just lashing out. Mm -hmm. But you don't want them to be so annoying that the viewer goes, I can't handle it anymore. I'm just going to turn off this show and stop watching. Um, so she was a challenge because it was very much trying to walk that line between the two. And she, she was just a child. She was just inexperienced and young and didn't know the protocol yet or how to go about what she, getting what she wanted. So she acted out in these ways that were so immature and, and awful. But yeah, it was, it was fun to put myself in that position. But looking back, it was very difficult too, because like I said, there's a very thin line between conveying that personality and completely turning off the viewer. Um, and that's, it was very hard to like be as aggressively annoying as I needed to be and yet not, and not turn people off from the sound and the, the emotion that was coming out because she is, she's pretty, pretty intense, that one. <laughs> pretty intense. I know one of your more, like restrained roles that's also very serious was like Kirika and Noir. Oh my gosh, I love that show. Thank you for mentioning it. I so it was on YouTube recently, I guess the anime network or somebody had put it on. And um there was a day that I was not feeling great and I was kind of playing around on the internet. I'm like, oh my gosh, Noir, I'm gonna go watch some of it. I'll be damned if it doesn't still hold up after all of these years. I was like, this is still a great show. I uh, that one was one that was early on in my career, I feel like the two shows that really taught me how to be a a great voice actor were Noir and Princess Nine. Mm -hmm. Um, Those two shows, I were such a learning experience. Kirika, because I had to convey so much emotion in these little, uh uh like just these monosyllabic like noises really. And that's, that's challenging as an actor to be like, okay, what am I really saying to Muriel in this little, uh uh-huh. And how do I convey that to the viewer? Uh, But it taught me so much. Like Kirika really was one of those, those learning experiences that I will never forget. And I'm incredibly thankful for her because I would not be the voice actor I am today if I had not had that experience. And when I had it that early on in my career, uh, plus what an awesome show, man. It's just a really, really great show. And I remember looking forward to all of the different ways that she would kill henchmen every week. Like that popcorn scene is still to this day, one of my all time favorites, uh, that and the, the throwing the guy over the rafter and hanging from the tie. That's, that's an image that will stick with me for the rest of my life. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think, I think the first series that instilled your voice in my head though, was a Saki and steel angel Kurumi. Oh my gosh, yes, I love that show. Oh my gosh, you really are bringing all the oldies and the goodies. <laughs> I loved Saki. Uh, and I think that this was on like one of the extras, but Stephen Foster was the director. Um, and I remember auditioning and for whatever reason, I couldn't remember her name, but I just fell in love with her as soon as I auditioned for her. I just loved the dynamic between her and Kurumi. I loved um, how she was constantly kind of like self-sabotaging herself. Uh, I just thought she was adorable. Um, and I remember seeing Steven out at a club and I couldn't remember her name, but I was like, I want to play the lesbian. I want to play the lesbian because <laughs> I thought she was so great. Um, and he made so much fun of me 
for that because uh, we were also at a gay bar. So here is me in the middle of everything, like, I want to play the lesbian. Everybody's like, do you? Uh, <laughs> which was awesome. Um, but that show, man, and to have so many different iterations of it, so many different seasons and so many different aspects of their personalities, it's just a great show. And I feel bad for kids today because I want to be like, here are the shows that you should be watching. Like if you've run out of stuff, you know, you've already caught up on Demon Slayer and My Hero and all this stuff, go back and watch some of the older stuff. Because even though the animation might look a little odd to you because, you know, it's older, it's hand-drawn usually, uh, those stories are still so different and still so special. Um, and it makes me sad to think that there's a whole generation of anime fans that hasn't experienced them. So mm -hmm. Steel Angel Kurumi, so good. <laughs> <laughs> This one, I don't think maybe anyone's ever talked to you about. Do you remember being um, Salad in Sorcerer Hunters? I do. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Sorcerer Hunters was a lot of fun because it was kind of like the 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 Where's Waldo of the ADV cast at that point. Yeah. Like people would pop up kind of all over the place. Super fun show. The comedy back then, um, some of it was a little etchy, but it was always just really really great comedic timing on that show i remember like just cracking up so much because uh just the way it was animated and they had such great timing like you would laugh and then it would just be a beat and then all of a sudden you're laughing again um and there's that that takes a lot of talent to be able to create a show that keeps you rolling but you still get all the pertinent information while you're going do you think such that you have, do you think that you have a preference for working on comedy opposed to dramatic or you know, I'm not good at choosing anything. <laughs> um, there's definitely pros to both. Um, I love comedy. That has been kind of my forte. I've always been kind of more of a character actor on stage and on screen. So um, that was kind of what I gravitated towards in anime. But there is that half of me that studied Shakespeare and loves the tragedies and the Greek tragedies. And so getting to do some of that tragic stuff too, especially in anime, because it doesn't happen as often, you know, as the comedy does a lot of times, or at least in my experience that I've experienced, I haven't done as much of the drama as I have the comedy. Um, but I love getting to do a little bit of both. And that's why I really enjoy anime is I get to do things that I would not get to do on stage or on screen. And as an actor, it really challenges you in, in ways that you would never think possible. So um, I was a little bit of both. <laughs> well, with um, more of like your long running, more like well-known characters, who do you think that you uh, relate to the most? Ooh, I would say it's hard. So um, the good thing about these long running characters is that they're long running. So you really get attached to them, right? You'll have to forgive me if you can hear my cat in the background. He's very upset that I'm talking to you and not to him. Uh, he's like singing the song of his people. Luckily, I'm in my booth, but he's pretty loud. Uh, so I forgot the question now because I got so distracted by Bruce. Oh, who you, who you relate to the most. Oh, gotcha. So when you're working that long with a character, you really get to know them. And I feel like instinctively as an actor, you kind of put a little bit of yourself in them. Um, so those characters that I've been voicing the longest are definitely the characters that I identify the most with overall. Um, I will say that the top two are probably Bulma and Suyu uh, from Dragon Ball and My Hero. Because Bulma from, I started with Dragon Ball Z Kai through Super, uh, she's grown a lot, right? As a, as a woman, as, as a female, um, as, a, as a nurturer, a mother she's gotten so much stronger and so much more vocal and standing up for herself and refusing to let them leave her behind anymore. And I feel like she has given me a strength. Like we've kind of grown up together and become these stronger ladies together as a result. And then with Suyu, Suyu is just, you know, she plays by the rules. She does what she's supposed to, to get the job done. Um, and she is die hard for her friends, right? Would do anything for her friends. And those things I definitely identify with. Like I follow the rules. I show up to things on time. I do everything I'm supposed to. But I also like my friends are my world and I would do anything for them. So those are the two that I definitely feel the closest to, I would say. Mm -hmm. How about with Rize in Tokyo? Girl? Oh, gosh. 
I, so <laughs> I love Rize for a totally different reason. Well, I mean, I love her for many reasons, but I actually was the script adapter for uh, Tokyo Ghoul in the beginning. It was Josh Greeley and I. I remember I had come off of fairy tale because I was the script adapter for the lead head lead writer for that one for many, many years. And I was like, look, I love fairy tale, but can I take a little break? And John Bergmeier, who was my boss at the time, was like, okay, I've got this show. It's the opposite of fairy tale. And I think you're really going to dig it because you know I liked the darker stuff. Um, when I first started watching that show, I was like, God, this character is so cool. I love her so much. And it's the only time I've ever gone to a director. I went to Mike McFarland and I was like, hey, I would just like the opportunity to audition for Rize because for whatever reason, she's really impacted me as a character. And he was like, oh, I was just going to cast you as Rize. And I'm like, done. I don't, cool. I'll take it. <laughs> but I was super stoked because she is just, she's, first of all, she's such a huge catalyst, right? Like, uh, you know, bringing Kaneki into this world and that whole first season when she's just kind of manipulating him from the sides. Uh, but what an interesting character too. And I just love that first season. I think it was just such a well-executed plot line. Um, that's one of the ones that I tell people whenever they ask, like if there was an anime that could become a Hollywood movie and you think would do really well and like Tokyo Ghoul, 100%. I don't know why anybody hasn't jumped on that yet. Cause that would be, it's a great premise. It's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. You're so good. Someday. <laughs> this was going back to, uh, I think maybe if I could pick one, my single favorite role of yours is uh, Eve in the Megazone 23 movies. Yes. That's why everybody thinks I've been acting since the early 80s. And my girl, I was like <laughs> five, but thanks. <laughs> no, I loved Eve. She was, first of all, she's so stinking cool, right? Like in every iteration, she's always cool. Um, but she's such a powerful woman too. And she's so strong and has so much going for her. Um, and those are like that at the time was an old show, even for us. Like we were like, whoa, look at the animation, look at all that. So now it's even harder to get like the young folks to watch shows like that. But Megazone 2, 3 was so awesome. And I loved that Matt Greenfield really paid super extra close attention. And he even wanted to kind of match the dub to kind of the dubs at the time while still kind of stepping it up a little bit. And he's, he was such a great, I mean, seriously, Matt Greenfield is one of the best directors I've ever worked with in the anime period. Um, but he, on that particular show, he spent so much attention to detail, so much. It was awesome. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you still have a lot of affinity with um, Zukuyomi? So weirdly enough, my entire career up until that point I had been in a lot of shows, but I hadn't done a lot of like lead carrying the show roles. And so Hazuki was one of my first, like, this is her show. Good luck. And um, I can't think of a cuter show to have been a part of like Hazuki, her bratty side is adorable. Her Luna side is adorable. Like just the whole thing and her little Lolita dresses and the pans falling from the roof. Like just the whole show is just one of my favorite experiences I've ever had. It's the first time I worked with Jason Liebrecht, um, who is a phenomenal actor. We had a blast working on it. Uh, just a great show all the way around. And I still get people that come to the conventions with Moon Phase, and it makes me so happy to sign because I'm like, I'm glad, and Steel Angel too, I'm glad that people are still watching these shows. I'm glad that they're still in rotation because they are, they're great shows. Mm -hmm. It was funny back when I had talked to um. Carrie Savage, like at the end of December, she was like, uh, when she got cast, she's like, Colleen said, you know, who can I get to play Monica's little sister? Because she has to have a higher pitch voice. <laughs> There's been a lot of that, like two in fairy tale. You've yeah. got me and Carrie again. And then it's like, who's higher pitch than Monica? Of course, now we've got a Sarah Wiedenhoff too. So, yeah. but back then it was like me and Carrie. It was like, if there was a kid in the show, it's either going to be Carrie Savage or Monica. <laughs> <laughs> And I know you got to do um, some substitute directing on uh, XXXholic with her. Yes, that was super fun. I think that, I mean, being in Tsubasa and the original Mokina is great and all, but that Mokina, Black Mokina is probably my favorite with his obsession with sake and, and all things Yuko. Um, that was a lot of fun to work with her on. It was also just a great experience. It was the first time that I worked with Todd Habercorn as a director and I was just amazed with his speed and capability as an actor and all of the little nuance he would add in and 
Um, talk about a great way to come in as a director and to start was with this show that had already been cast beautifully. So I didn't have to worry about that. Um, and just kind of leading these very, very accomplished actors on this journey that they did an absolutely beautiful job with. Mm-hmm. And Colleen as Yuko is still one of my favorite characters she's ever done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so great. Do you still have people uh, ever talk to you about a uh, Lumiere at all, Kitty Grade? Every once in a while. And it's funny, I just talked about Colleen. That was the show where Colleen and I first met. Um, she was the, uh, you know, she was the lead, Eclair. And so she ended up being the director after a while. Uh, it was also my very, very, very first show at Funimation. Um, I remember falling in love with the art for Kitty Grade. And at that time, most Gonzo shows were going to ADV. So I thought, oh, it's a shoe in Like, we're going to get Kitty Grade. No worries. And I was at a convention. And I had just met Mike McFarland. And they announced that Funimation had Kitty Grade. And I was like, wait, I thought this was like the Dragon Ball Yu Yu Hakusho studio. I, like, I thought they weren't a threat. What is happening? Now we've lost the show that I wanted to be in. And so I remember talking to, to Mike about it. And he's like, wow, you really, you're really interested in this show. I'm like, yes, I fell in love with this character design. She's adorable. Um, and he goes, well, would you be willing to go up to Dallas? And I'm like, I mean, if they'd have me, not thinking it would ever happen. And I got a call several months later um, from the talent coordinator. And she's like, hey, we need to book you for eight hours for, uh, for Kitty Grade. And I was like, what? It turns out that Mike McFarland had taken Excel Saga to Justin Cook. And was like, she's interested in playing Lumiere. You need to listen to it. So I got cast as Lumiere from Hyatt, which is funny. Um, And I'll never forget one of the first things Justin said to me when I came in for my first session as Lumiere was, oh, my God, that's your real voice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, my real voice. Yeah, nice to meet you too, Mr. Cook. Uh, But yeah, that will forever have a very special place in my heart because not only was it a really cool show and the character designs, and I love all things Gonzo, but uh, it's where I met Colleen and she's still to this day one of my best friends. So it's a special show. (laughs) Is there much of a story with um, your roles as uh, Saya and uh, the pig and uh, Peacemaker? Oh my gosh. So that was fun because how often do you get to play a mute and a critter at the same time. And at that time, oddly enough, you know, sometimes Japan gets on kicks, like you'll see a bunch of characters with eye patches or a bunch of German characters. So at that time, for whatever reason, there was like this, this, this group of mutes that came through anime. Um, and Matt Greenfield originally thought it would be really funny to cast me as the mute because I am a chatty Kathy. And so that kind of became like the thing for a while. If there was a mute character, people were like, Monica, I'll take it. Uh, so with Peacemaker, when that came around, they were like, oh, there's a mute, Monica. Oh, there's a critter, Monica. Uh, I had so much fun working on it, though. I will never forget there was a time when um, some of the Japanese businessmen came over to kind of see, from Gonzo, to kind of see how things were going or whatever. So they go see Lucy Christian. She does this magnificent, like, dramatic scene. And they go see Chris Patton, and he's doing some great comedy scene. And then they come in to see me and I'm working on Peacemaker. And it was a scene where Saizo is angry because mm-hmm. he's angry all the time. And so they're like, oh, this is Monica, you know, and she's been working with us forever. And they're like, oh, nice to meet you. All of the formalities and everything. And then I get in the booth and it's literally <laughs> like looking gross and spitting everywhere. And then you can just see them. And then I come out and one of the, one of the gentlemen is like, oh, Genki, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> But yeah, that was, it was a lot of fun. And I remember the Saizo hat, uh, my mom was so proud that I had a hat. <laughs> it's a little angry pig hat. She's like, oh, that's my daughter. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was a super fun show. Mm-hmm. Good memories, man. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, more recently, but I think you're the, yeah, you're, you're the second person from Texas I've talked to who was in uh, Fire Emblem Heroes. Everybody else has been in California. Yeah. That one was really, really cool because I didn't know I was going to be in Fire Emblem Heroes. So I had worked with uh, the Cup of Tea guys, the guys that recorded it out in LA several times. We had worked on um, Tales of Berseria and a few other things. Um, And I remember getting a call like, hey, Monica, we want to see your availability because we have this role that we would like you to play. And I'm like, 
okay. You think LA, right? It's very rare that they call and be like, we need you. Mm -hmm. Um, And she had told me, the director had said, you know, we had auditions and I just couldn't find anybody to do this voice. And I was like, oh, what a huge compliment. So I get there and I find out I'm a freaking goddess. And I'm like, wait, you couldn't find a goddess in all of LA? I am feeling loved. (laughs) So it was a lot of fun to work on. And I love Mila. I love that she uh, is a revered goddess, but at the same time has a little bit of a temper. Um, those cut scenes were really great. And some of the talent I got to work with, even though we weren't together, getting to play opposite them was fantastic. Um, I'm huge fans and uh, friends with uh, both Erica's Lynn Beck and uh, Mendez. So getting to hear them and some of it, like there's just, it's really cool getting to, to be introduced into a new group of actors and getting to hear how they sound and working opposite them. So yeah, Fire Emblem's been, it's been a lot of fun and I enjoy working. I've done some more stuff, um, not necessarily with Fire Emblem, but just, you know, out in LA. So here's hoping in the next year or so, there'll be some stuff coming out that'll be exciting to announce. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I know some of the most recent things that you were a uh, part of are the Tales of Luminaria and uh, Phantom Code. Yes, Phantom Codebreaker, which is coming soon. Yep. Super soon. Um, those are super fun. Uh, the Phantom Codebreaker, um, Omnia, I'm going to butcher it because that's, but Finn, I've been so excited about her because she is just a callback to all of those aggressive, cute, loud mouth characters that I used to play back in the day and I don't get to do as often anymore. So that was a lot of fun to do. And then in the Tales of Luminaria, Laplace is just just great like she's got so many different levels one minute she's cold and calculating the next minute she's oozing sex appeal the next minute she's like I'm innocent what are you talking about so she's been a lot of fun to play I really hope that that game does well and that we get to continue working on it while I'm the future mm-hmm. on that note I gotta get going because I gotta head to my next thing but it was awesome talking to you ma'am you just walked me down memory lane in the best way possible oh thank you <laughs> And seriously, in the future, I'm going to try to do uh, more stuff like this. I know it's been a while because last year was just boo-boo, but uh, here's hoping that 2022 will be better for all of us and 2023 will be even better. So if you ever want to chit-chat again, reach out to us and we'll make it happen. Okay, great. Thank you. It was so nice meeting you and chatting. Yeah, you as well. (laughs) Well, take care, sweetheart. I'll see you soon.